Good morning. Welcome again to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. It's the Lord's Day, October 25th, 2020. May God bless you as you worship with us. Diane and I are still on holiday, but we've pre-recorded parts of this service. Andrew Harbridge will lead our worship. He will also read the scripture this morning. Sylvie Copland will play and sing the children's song with her husband, Malcolm Copland, who also puts the service online each week. My wife, Diane, will tell the children's story. Dr. Mark Bond is our guest speaker. And I'm Pastor David Richardson. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. We praise you, our God, and we ask that you would help us to praise you. Help us as we worship, and also as we hear a message from our speaker this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I am so glad you decided to join us today. Let's begin our worship by singing the great hymn, Like a River Glorious. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious in His bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth fuller every day. Perfect yet Groweth deeper all the way. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Hidden in the can follow, never traitor stand. Not a search of worry, not a shade of care, not a blast of hurry, touch the spirit there. Reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage 
with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Our gospel song this morning is, I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves me and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask Him, He will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly and end. tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and He will help me over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. 
Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Our contemporary hymn this morning is Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin, the people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a near revival Stirring as we pray and see We're on our knees We're on our knees Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your 
kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the Good morning, kids. It's now your part of the service, and you know how it goes. There's a song and a story for you. Oh, be careful, little Miles, what you say. Oh, be careful, little Miles, what you say. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little Miles, what you say. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Thank you, Sylvie and Malcolm. Good morning, children. I was reading my Bible and came across this verse in Psalm 31. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. David sang, Show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me. There are many verses in the Bible that talk about how important truth is to God. God never lies. He always keeps his promises. There is a verse that says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That is God speaking. And you can trust that he loves you and will love you forever and ever. Because God is truth, we must speak the truth too. If you tell a lie, it is very important to say sorry to the person you lied to, and then to say sorry to God. He promises to forgive us, so you don't need to be afraid. He also promises to not remember when you do wrong and say sorry, so you don't have to keep thinking about it. God is truth. What he says, we can count on. We will want to be truthful, too, because that would please him. 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you are truth. You never lie or break a promise. What the Bible says we can count on. Thank you that you love us and forgive us when we do wrong. Please help the children to say sorry and to talk to you about their troubles. Please keep the children well and safe. We love them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Andrew, Sylvie and Malcolm, and Diane. Our guest speaker this morning is Mark Bond. Mark and I have been friends since we lived in the same dormitory at Ontario Bible College back in the 70s. He was president of Emmanuel Bible College until he retired a few years ago. He lives in Cambridge, Ontario. We look forward to God's blessing as Mark ministers to us this morning. Good morning, Church. This morning we're going to think about something that you may feel you're a bit of an expert on, especially if you've been attending church for years. We're going to talk about the sermon. You've heard thousands of them, and many times they've begun with something a little bit like this. Sermons. Speaking of sermons, you ever notice how long some of them are? I remember one preacher who stepped into the pulpit and before he started preaching, he apologized for the band-aid on his face. It seems he told the congregation, this morning I brought my notes into the bathroom to review while I was shaving, and while I was looking at my sermon, I cut my face. So then he goes on preaching and he goes into this 45 minute sermon on the dietary laws in Leviticus. And at the end of the service, he gets met at the door by one of the deacons who tells him, Pastor, just one word of advice for the future. Next time, why don't you look at your face and cut the sermon? And of course, preachers can be arrogant. I mean, what gives them the right to single people out? My dear old granny got spitting mad one time. We had a new preacher, and he started off his first sermon yelling about the evils of gambling. So my granny, she starts amening up a storm. Then he goes out to calling down drinking, and my granny whoops it, Preach it, brother! Then he goes on to a stretch about the evils of gossiping. And I can still remember granny screaming from the back pew, Now you've done stop preaching and gone to meddling! And who do these pastors think they are, anyway? Are they the star? Who gives them the right to think about what they say is worth hearing? My good friend Charlie from Chad in Africa told me of a preacher, a preacher who went on a missions trip. He doesn't speak the language, so he has to get an interpreter. Uh, and he gets up to speak in this little hut on John 3.16. And he, he begins... Look, there. Let me get this out. I have it here. I wrote it down. It's, it's a butte. He's in this little hut, and he starts... The beatific familiarity of this exquisite prose must never overwhelm its transcendent and profound call upon our inmost beings. Well, when the translator gets a hold of this, he tells the people, the speaker hasn't said anything worth remembering so far, and if he ever gets there, I'll let you know. Okay, bad, bad stand-up comedy or sit-down comedy in the age of COVID. And enough of these miserable attempts at comedy. The standard joke at the beginning of a sermon is almost a joke in and of itself. The visiting preacher tells a joke. Pastor tells a story. It's to get the congregation focused and on your side. Now I've got a question. If you're not on my side, then whose side are you on? So I'd like us to continue thinking about this because our sermon has a poor reputation. There are jokes made about sermons. People tear apart sermons at the end of the day or over dinner when they've got roast preacher. And our text today describes a preacher's nightmare. I mean, somebody falls asleep, and that's not unusual. We've all seen this, or this, or even this in a church. Sometimes we've even seen this. So is it the job of the preacher to entertain the crowd? 
Is that the job of the preacher to, to get a standing ovation from people? What's it all about? Now, we all know that as one woman once told me, not all sermons are duds, Pastor. And you can imagine how that made me feel. What makes for a good or even a great sermon? Some people are naturally gifted speakers. They've got a great voice. Some are good storytellers and could have made a living on the stage. Maybe they, maybe they can even wow you with a really great PowerPoint presentation. But does that make it a worthwhile sermon? Or does it lead to what I call the horror at the door? Listen to me carefully, please. And I'm going to let you on, in on a preacher's secret. The secret sadness of any preacher who has prayed and worked over a text of scripture, who sought the Holy Spirit for understanding and for power, and who has stepped into the pulpit deeply conscious of the weight of responsibility carrying for the right handling of the Word of God. And then when the sermon is over, and the preacher is standing at the back, shaking hands, first one person, and then another, says those fateful and soul-crushing words. What are they? I really enjoyed your sermon this morning. You've probably said it. I've asked pastors about this, and very frequently they visibly wince when I describe this scene to them. Enjoyed? Enjoyed? For me, a good jazz album is meant to be enjoyed. Uh, deep fudge brownies with extra thick icing and a glass of milk are meant to be enjoyed. But sermons are meant to provoke and teach and to open a pathway to the living God. Tell me you got upset, or you had to think, or you needed to pray, or you're going to go home and study and prove me wrong. Wonderful! But a sermon's not meant to be enjoyable. It's not meant to have you stand up and applaud me, or Pastor Dave, or anybody else. As the old saying goes, sermons are meant to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, but enjoyed for any preacher, that is the least of their intent. Is it our hope when we come to church that we'll enjoy the sermon, or for that matter, enjoy the singing, enjoy the teaching, enjoy the sound system, enjoy the announcements, or the fellowship or anything else? Or do we come to worship God? There really is only one worth applauding. The word worship is an old English word we use to translate the Bible. And the word is really worthship. The psalmist says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If you if only you would listen to his voice today. When we come to worship, we come to honor God, to treat him as he is really worth. We're offering what we do in that pew to God. As some of us in the contemporary uh, day think of singing as the worship. And it's sometimes uh, we use the word wrongly. And in some churches, people will say, oh, the sermon comes after the worship and the prayer. But no, the, the prayer is part of the worship. And so is the offering. And so most definitely is the sermon. It too is an offering to God. So when we come to church, we have to ask ourselves if we're willing to put aside our own preferences, our own wants and desires, and come into the presence of the living God, not to be entertained. If this is about God, if our worship service is really about God, then this isn't some variety show. I mean, I know I can so easily be sucked into the world's attitude of seeking entertainment instead of hearing the call to worship. Sometimes, and in some churches, we've mis mixed the two. And I know I've seen soloists 
in a church who've sung or a choir has sung and then there's clapping afterwards and i know people want to give their thanks to the person but the person themselves is showing their appreciation to god their song is for god not for us well in our text today we're going to be heading into a room in troas macedonia in northern greece to explore what happened during the preaching of a sermon by some fellow named paul and first to begin we're going to let paul set up the story when the uproar had ended paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them said goodbye and set out for macedonia he traveled through that area saying many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in greece where he stayed three months because some jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for syria he decided to go back through macedonia the brothers went on ahead and waited for us at troas so paul is now in troas a city that has a christian contingent it's sunday and what do you want to do on sunday you want to hear the word of god paul's ready to preach but we sailed from philippi after the festival of unleavened bread and five days later joined the others at troas where we stayed for seven days on the first day of the week we came together to break bread paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day kept talking until midnight they didn't do things quite the way we did we think that our churches uh, don't have formal liturgies and worship patterns but most of us don't like it when the service order changes from week to week compared to troas we're slaves to order first they met in the evening when people could come many were servants or slaves and couldn't come during the day then they came together to eat and to fellowship and to hear the word and take communion all in one long glorious meeting in fact it looks like communion was done in the context of a potluck supper and nobody had watches or phones with alarms so that the meeting began when people got there and ended when it was over so they're meeting in a hot room paul is talking until midnight there are many lamps in the upstairs room where they're meeting so it's warm seated in the window was a young man named eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as paul talked on and on don't know how exciting the message was i'm sure it was deep but eutychus he's had dinner it's late it's hot he's sitting in a window to try and catch a bit of a breeze he can lean back and he starts falling asleep when he was sound asleep he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead i think you can imagine what happened if you're like most of us when you're falling asleep there's quite often a time where you kind of jerk yourself awake for a second before you go back to sleep all the way and my guess is that eutychus had one of those jerks and he fell and it says paul went down and threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him don't be alarmed he said he's alive then he went upstairs and broke bread and ate after talking until daylight he left the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted an exciting thing to happen but look at this all this happens and what do they do they go back and they hear more of the message then they take eutychus home back in troas nobody cares about the time nobody cares that it's approaching dawn what could make a sermon such a powerful thing well part of it is what's happening in the preacher and part of it's what's happening in the congregation we'll start with the latter eutychus and his name actually means lucky it doesn't seem so lucky at first does he at least until he's brought back to life why do you think the story is recorded by luke 
Is it just to be kind of a humorless interlude for we modern readers? Is it to show Paul's power and another miracle? When we look deeply at the text, we can see that the story of Eutychus is really a warning for you and for me. It's a warning that if we're not careful, our faith may grow tired and dim, just like our eyes when we're sleepy. If we're not ready to hear, if we are not prepared to receive the message, we may fall. But God is always ready to call us back. So the story is about us, about all Christians through the ages. Are we prepared, ready to receive God's word? Are we the good soil that the word may fall upon and bring fruit? Did we get ourselves ready by prayer and reflection, even this morning, to worship and hear God? And second, we need to look at the preacher, in this case, the Apostle Paul, and look at his attitude and the urgency of his message, the importance of his message. Look at his life, his commitment to the word and to prayer, the desire to stay true to his conscience and to the leading of the spirit. Elsewhere, we learn that St. Paul was not exactly a spellbinding orator. He might be able to put somebody to sleep. No great speaker, and he wasn't much to look at either, it seems. But there's a power in his message because of his conviction and because of the spirit which calls him to be true to the word which God has given him, no matter what opposition may arise. For a while, I served at a Bible college in Edmonton and we attended a church, McLaurin Baptist, in the late 90s. And John, the pastor there at the time, was one of the worst speakers we had ever heard. He spoke softly. There was little inflection in his voice. He was very formal. A horrible speaker, but one of the best preachers we had ever heard. Because God's spirit was with him, the gift of preaching was with him, the word was in him, and God's love shone through him. And my family wanted to hear every word that that man said. And that's one reason we have the sermon, because God has selected and empowered people to speak words of truth and to open the Bible up to the church and to the world. We need more than sermons. We need good teaching. We need to study the word together and in groups. We need to pray. We need fellowship. But God has given us the preacher and the sermon. And I'm going to read to you now a number of passages from the book of 1st and 2nd Timothy, written by the Apostle Paul in the, first, uh, in the first century to Timothy, a younger man who had taken up the call of pastoring and preaching. And this is what Paul says to him. 1st Timothy 4, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophesy, when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Timothy had a gift, and in that gift he's going to immerse his preaching and teaching in scripture. Not to talk about all sorts of unusual things, not to talk about necessarily the affairs of the world, unless the lens of scripture is brought on them, then that's worthwhile. But the public reading of scripture and to preaching and to teaching, which is what he is to give to the church, he's to be diligent and give himself wholly to them. And he's gotta be careful. He's gotta watch his own life and doctrine. He has to be true to God's calling and to the word. Well, 1 Timothy 6, command those rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides for us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. 
In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. What right does the pastor have to challenge us? What right does the sermon have to tell us how to live or to call us to think or to make us uncomfortable? <laughs> God through Paul tells the preacher to command us to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and to be willing to share. There is the right of command. It is not the command of the preacher. It is when the preacher speaks the words and the truth of God that there is complete and total right to command. That's hard for us. It's hard for me. I'm a rebellious soul. But I better be careful to see if what's being said is true to the word. And if I think it isn't, then I'd better study it, hadn't I? Instead of just going and complaining. In 2 Timothy, Paul talks about himself first and then tells Timothy, and of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and that's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him against that day. From the old hymn, we know that. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. It was a great old song. What you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The pastor has a job, the preacher has a job of ensuring that it is sound teaching and must not just insert their own desires or their own patterns into it. To guard the deposit that was entrusted so that the teaching can be sound, so that the teaching can be worthwhile, so that the teaching will be what is required for the people. And finally, 2 Timothy 4, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people won't put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. Be prepared in season and out through the preaching of the word to correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. The sermon is not for angry denunciations of the people. The sermon is for patience and instruction and for God's love to come through the word of God. Oh, it may be a hard word. It may be a strong word. But with patience and instruction, we are to learn from the word of God as it is open to us. And that's what the sermon is. And that's what the ministry of preaching is to be. The great preacher of the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, said, Preach not calmly and quietly as though you were asleep, but preach with fire and pathos and passion. This is the word of God. And the preacher needs to be faithful to God, to pour out of the self, not a show, not a lecture, but from the depths of one's inmost being and calling. The reformer Martin Luther gave this difficult quote, both for the preacher and for the congregation. Always preach in such a way that if the people listening do not come to hate their sin, they will instead hate you. I'm going to read that again. Think about that. Take that home and digest it. Always preach in such a way that if the people listening do not come to hate their sin, they will instead hate you. God has some pretty important and strong things to say in his word. 
There may be good seed in the sermon, but does it take root or is it snatched away by the birds or trampled underfoot or choked by weeds? What happens in you and me when the sermon begins? I have to ask you, I have to ask myself, am I prepared for the message? Most of those people in Troas certainly were. They knew who Paul was. They came for the word of God and not for the show. They came prepared to wait out the clock if that's what God wanted. They came anticipating something from God, not just waiting for the time to expire. How many Sundays have I sat where you are sitting now and wondered about an upcoming football game on TV or the dinner to come or the visit of friends or family? or I've grumbled internally about some song that morning that I didn't like, or a prayer request which seemed odd to me. And on some of those days, I have willingly, intentionally put on the guise of a pouting child. You want to speak to me, God? Well, it's up to you to get through, because I'm not really listening. And sometimes I've looked at the preacher, or, or sadly, and this is confession, even God, as some sort of know-it-all who doesn't really understand me and who almost is full of his own self-importance. What arrogance. God made me. How dare I tune him out? I have declared myself to be part of a people who have come to hear the word of God, and then I take it lightly. In doing so, I blaspheme God's power and his love. I indict myself now before you. So often I and perhaps you treat the holy as the ordinary. We get used to it. But in Troas, the people came prepared, eager to hear God speak. Even though the time was inconvenient and the speaker known to be something of a long winded type. And the pastor must be prepared. George Whitfield, the great uh, leader of revival in the uh, 1700s, other men may preach the gospel better than I, but no man can preach a better gospel. It's not our words as a preacher. We are to preach the truth of Scripture, prepared to preach the truth. May not be fancy, but it is to be from God. And we are to be confident in the gospel. And we are to be wholly committed to God. John Wesley, another great revival, a little bit earlier. Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Such alone will shake the gates of hell. If you wonder why a preacher preaches strongly with confidence, it's because we're in a battle and the gates of hell need to be shaken. Do you want such a pastor and do you want such preaching or would you like something easier, less difficult to deal with? We've got to be careful with the attitudes we bring to the sermon. And a great Catholic once said, the test of a preacher is that his congregation goes away saying, not what a lovely sermon, but I will do something. I think maybe he had met the horror at the door at some point when people said, that was an enjoyable message, Frank. I don't doubt that many in the congregation at Troas prayed during the message, prayed that God would empower the preacher, that the Holy Spirit would be present in the room, that the power of God would be unleashed in their midst. And in such a case, with such support, even the weakest among us might preach to the angels themselves. For the word of God committed and communicated truly and listened to with an open heart is sharp and powerful and shakes the gates of hell, can work miracles. And miracles were done in Troas that night. The first miracle was a tired young man now dead from an accident, is raised to life. There's power in that place. The Spirit is present. 
Paul is ready to be used. The people are eager to receive God's grace, and Eutychus is raised to life. The dead live. That's a miracle. And the second miracle? After midnight, after a late night meal in a smoky upper room, and a sermon to midnight, there's a disruption like this, and then they all say, let's go back to hear more from the word of God. <laughs> they wanted a second sermon that went till dawn. Now that's a miracle to almost rival the first. I don't want to be facetious. I hope to express the nature of the sermon and the calling of the preacher and the calling of the people. It is in this unique intersection which we have in the word of God where the Spirit speaks the word of truth to us all, pastor and people, making us a fit people for worship of God, fellowship with each other, and service to our world. A sermon is not to be an enjoyable thing. It's to be an avenue to the very heart of God. And to those of you who have been nodding off during this very message, I leave you and the rest of us with these words also appropriate to Eutychus. Words written to the Ephesian church. Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, for Christ will shine on you. Words that perhaps need to be tattooed on the inside of our eyelids. Amen. God be with you. Our closing hymn today is Here I Am to Worship.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.